In study mechanics, we will continue to classify objects, but this time not by taste or touch, but rather by position, location, or even the motion that an object makes. Try this as a first activity. Ask your students to think about where they're located in the classroom. How would they identify that particular spot to another student? Think about words that would help them closest to, in front of, behind, furthest away from. And then ask about what would be a good way to do it. How would you identify your spot? Could you say, I'm sitting behind Sally? That might not be so good because Sally could be absent tomorrow. Or could you say, I'm sitting near the windows? How many other people may be sitting near the windows? Once you've got the idea out, give each student an index card. Have them put their name at the top and go on and identify their particular location in the room. Collect all the cards and read them off one by one. See if the rest of the class can guess who the mystery student is. And then, of course, you can read the student's name. This is a good beginning activity in understanding location and grid patterns, which we'll go to next. Let's start with one lone dot on a piece of paper. How would you identify its exact position? It's not so easy. But if this dot was surrounded by a bunch of other fixed points, other dots, and even better yet, the rows and the columns were identified with the letters A through E and 1 through 5, it would be very easy to identify this dot as A2. You can use a grid pattern like this to get your students to understand coordinates. Have them, for example, draw a square around B2, maybe a circle around D3, or a triangle around C5. From here we can go to a matrix with letters instead of dots. Make sure that your rows and columns are listed by number so it's not confusing. Give your students a series of coordinates that they can decipher to find out what the mystery word is. As your students become proficient in deciphering words and deciphering locations of dots, then you go to the next step, and that's reading maps. You've noticed that maps have these same types of coordinates with letters across one axis and numbers across the other, and it allows us to find a street very easily. You might make up a fake map that has all these different streets on it. Use the names of the students in the class. Give a little directory like Fred Street and what is the coordinates for Fred Street. Let them fill in the proper coordinates then you can check it. If you have an exceptionally good class, you may give them a copy of a real map, perhaps your hometown, and have them identify the coordinates of a particular street. Now we want to go to the next step in map reading and locating position, and that's understanding the directions north, south, east, and west, and getting from point A to point B on our map. Here's a good little activity to do. Have, make one of these little spinners and make it on a grand scale, maybe about five or ten times larger than you see here. You see that it has all the directions and different numbers. Give each student a piece of graph paper with coordinates on it and a little drawing of a car somewhere in the center. Then have selected students take a spin of the spinner and determine which direction and how many paces everybody's car is to move. As you go through about 10 or 15 spins, the cars will progress along the graph paper. Hopefully, everybody's car will end out at the same coordinate point. This is a good activity in understanding position and movement because now we want to go back to the neighborhood map and start at point A on the map and ask the students which streets they should travel on, which direction they should go, and how far on that particular street to get to another destination point, point B. We're understanding position and location and how we fix a position by reference points and also we're getting a real good basic understanding in map reading. Another fundamental concept in mechanics is understanding that events can be sequenced and ordered by time. Let's take a series of pictures of a ball bouncing. Let the students color them in, cut them out, and then order them the way the ball would normally look as it bounces. You can staple them all together and flip them in succession just like the movie picture and actually see the ball move. Let's investigate machines, and as we do, remember that when you're teaching elementary school in science, you can be just a little crazy if you want to. So what we're going to do is head for the wind-up toys. I brought my two favorite ones out. This little guy walks, and this little guy does backflips, the little gorilla. You may have seen him in the earth science tape. 
Now what we're going to study is the number of turns as we wind it up. And you have to put a piece of tape on part of the key. So we'll call this one full turn to when the tape starts at one place to when it comes all the way around and returns to the starting point. After we do it one turn, we want to see how far this little guy can walk. So we need a starting point and we need some kind of measuring. We're going to use a piece of tape as a starting point and we'll line his front feet up right on the tape and we'll let him go. Walk. Well, that's an interesting observation. He doesn't walk in one wind, so we put down zero for one. Now we go to two, so we wind it one more. And we continue this, and we make the measurements. Looks like he's in a little start there. Okay, we got him walking now. The question is, how far will he walk? And here we have a apparent problem. He's starting to veer to the right, and this might happen when you're doing the experiment. Probably best in this situation is you want to measure the distance he moved or the car moved, whatever you're using. So you might want to use a piece of string and lay the string out and show the students that you're actually measuring the real path that he traveled. But for simplicity's sake, I'll just go from his front feet back to my tape again and I'll get 15 centimeters. And now we come to my philosophy on the metric system. It's really much easier to read a distance in centimeters because every little line after it is a tenth. And there's ten of them, so it's one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, and so on. Whereas in the English system, you've got to remember words like quarters and eighths and sixteenths and thirty seconds. I would recommend you start your students learning on the metric system first. Six and eight tenths, or six point eight and then go to the English system if you're talking about measuring. Or you could have them make both measurements at the same time so they can start to see the relationship between six inches being 15 centimeters. But let's get back to this problem at hand. And this problem is this little guy that walked 15 centimeters on trial number one. If we wound him up twice again and went to trial number two, how many centimeters do you think he'd go? And I have to confess with you, earlier I've been testing this little guy, and I found out that on one run he did 14, another run he did 17, this one was 15. Gives me an idea of the range that he can walk with two wines. These are kinds of ideas that you want to get across to your student, arriving to the best guess answer by doing a number of experiments. Now let's go to the next step. If we wound him three times, how far would he go? Now we're making a prediction from our earlier information, and then we want to actually go through with the experiment and make some more tests. After you do it once, ask your students if one time is enough. Hopefully by now they'll say, no, we better test him three or four times. Great activity. Let me talk about my little gorilla now. This guy's great. He doesn't have a key, so if you want to mark it for going a full turn, you just put a little black dot on the knob like you see here. Then we'll wind him up a couple turns, and instead of seeing how far he walks, you see how many backflips he can do. I know you're all going to be going out to the toy store now that you've seen this. But we can talk about another thing here, too. We can talk about the energy required to make this little man walk. This is spring energy, where you wind energy into it with the muscles in your arms. And that energy is stored up in the spring and then released when he's on the table. And the energy you put into it allows him to walk forward. And where does the energy come that we use to wind this toy up? We eat food to get our energy. And the food we eat derives its energy from the sun. Many of the energy sources on Earth come indirectly from the sun. For example, water power, falling water, is caused by rain that falls on the mountains. And that rain came from water that evaporated from the oceans. And it took sunlight to evaporate that water. And winds are caused by uneven heating of the Earth. So the sun also causes that energy. There's many different forms of energy and many forms that we use. One form is the energy of falling objects, the force of gravity. And we can harness that energy when something goes from one height to a lower height. When it's up here, it has gravitational energy stored into it. When it goes to a lower point, that gravitational energy is reduced by a certain amount. And we can convert one energy form into another. So we might be able to convert that change in gravitational energy into a form that's more useful for us. Let's do that. 
was this next activity, a cardboard ramp elevated on one end, and this time our problem is to determine which one of these cars will roll the furthest. Will it be the van with the four large tires, or will it be the dump truck with the six smaller tires? Which one do you think? Let's do the experiment. Here goes the van first. We want to measure from the front of the van to the end of the ramp. 19 centimeters. We've taken this van from this height to this height and we've put some of that energy into forward motion. Remember 19 centimeters. Now let's try the dump truck. The dump truck seems to be going faster and goes quite a bit further. Looks like about 40 centimeters. Appreciably further. What have we shown here? We've only shown one thing, that this vehicle goes further than this one. Why don't they both continue to just keep going? There must be some force that's resisting them, something that's slowing them down and stopping them, and that force is friction. You want to get this idea across to your students too. What are the possibilities for friction? What is causing this vehicle to slow down sooner than this one? Air resistance, the bearings on the wheels, maybe the size of the wheels, maybe the weight of the vehicle. Lots of different activities and areas and directions you can go to investigate. And if you think scientifically, which you all can do now, you should be able to run this experiment through and make some real valid scientific investigations. If you want to go further into this activity, you can start varying the ramp height, seeing how that affects the distance it goes. Or varying the surface of the ramp. Try a piece of plastic or try a piece of carpeting or something like that. Or you might even try varying the weight of the vehicle. Put a big fishing weight in the dump truck and see what effect that has on it. Whatever you do, you'll find that you can always turn a toy into a science lesson. Here's a primary activity that appears to be a math activity, but in fact has a lot of science implications too. First, it covers chemistry properties of materials. Which one of these is blue and triangular? This one. It also covers position. How would you identify the position of this particular object? Well, it's between the brown square and the brown triangle. So we're talking about mechanics, too. Another thing you can do with this is remove it from the student's view, switch a couple of these around, bring it back up, and ask them to identify which ones were moved. This allows them to understand more about position and how you're identifying the location of an object with respect to the objects around it. Energy is continually being converted from one form to another. And whenever a conversion takes place, there's a certain amount of energy lost in the form of friction, resistance. Anytime there's a moving object, it's always being slowed down by some type of resistance or friction. And every machine has a certain amount of friction, which gets lost as perhaps heat energy. We can experience friction ourselves by rubbing our palm along a piece of our clothing and make your palm as flat as possible and put a little pressure on it. You don't have to press real hard. Immediately your hand starts to get hot. What we're doing is we're exciting the molecules in our hand and on our shirt and we're making them vibrate faster. And that's the definition of heat. Now we want to go on and reinforce friction and the concept of friction with an activity like this. And it's a fun activity. I'm sure you've all wanted to know which material offers the most resistance. Would it be sandpaper, cardboard, or construction paper? And while I'm here, look at what else we have. We have a ruler mounted along this side and we have a pencil for a bearing surface. And when you do this in your class, use your tabletops instead of a cardboard box. Each student group gets a little apparatus like this, the bottom of two plastic cups that have been cut off. This one has a string going through it and tied off with a paper clip, and this one is hanging in a little harness. We'll start by testing the uh, sandpaper. We'll put the cup at the 15 centimeter mark. So the front of the cup is lined up at 15 centimeters. And we'll put five pennies inside this top cup. Make sure that the string, and make sure it's a smooth string so you, don't, you can minimize the friction, is running along the bearing surface pencil. And these can be pencils just taped on. Now we want to see how many pennies it'll take for this cup 
to pull this cup from 15 centimeters down to 10 centimeters. We want to keep everything as consistent as possible. We're trying to maintain control over our variables, as we talked about earlier. I think it'll be about 10, rather than count them out. We'll test it. Remind your students to ease the tension on the string very slowly. We now have a value that represents the friction of sandpaper, 10 pennies. And we want to record that number because we want to go on and compare it to the other materials that we'll test. And when you do this in your class, set up about five to ten stations and have your groups of students go around with their own apparatus and their own 20 pennies and test each material. You can try materials like aluminum foil or wax paper. There's many different surfaces you can use. Not only are the students going to be understanding friction, but it's a very classic science experiment. Let me tell you why. Not only are we going through the whole scientific process from making a guess as to which one we think has the most friction to coming up with a conclusion about which one really does, but you'll find when your student groups get back at their desks and you start comparing results, you're going to find some discrepancies. Group three may have gotten 12 or 13 pennies for the sandpaper, and I got 10. Why do we have discrepancies like that? And you can't just wave these differences away, because this is really the foundation of science learning, is dealing with the discrepancies and trying to understand why something came out different. Why would another group do the same experiment, basically the same experiment, and come out with different results? Ask your students why they think it might have happened. And give them a few hints if necessary, but don't offer the answers to them. Let them brainstorm the answer. Typical response might be that group three's cup may have been rougher than my cup and it had more friction. There's many different avenues you can pursue and there's more additional experiments that you can go on and try to prove your suspicions. Once you get going on this, you're really going to get the students interested not only in friction, but also in doing science. And this is what's really important. Ponder this question with your students. How would you lift a fully grown adult completely off the ground and use only one hand and very little force at it? Well, it's time to introduce simple machines. And the simple machine we'll use is the lever. A lever has three parts. It has a fulcrum, the part that the lever turns on. It has a load, which is the object that we want to move. And it has a force, the energy that we exert to move the object. Now, you could stand on the end of this 2x4, and the 2x4 is about 5 or 6 feet long, and you can have your fulcrum about 12 or 15 inches in from where you're standing and any one of your students can very easily with one hand lift you up into the air. How does it work? It's amazing. Well, look at what's happening. You're pushing down for a long distance, for that whole distance there, and you're only raising the load a very short distance. So you're exerting your energy throughout a very long distance to do a certain amount of work. If it was in the middle, what would happen? Well, it takes more force to lift this rock, and we aren't pushing it through as great a distance, and we're actually raising the rock a larger distance. So there's definite mechanical advantages to the location of this fulcrum. There's three kinds of levers. Let's take a look at each, but let's use one that's smaller than the one we're working with here. The one I just showed you is called the first class lever. It has the fulcrum between the load and the force. The load's on one end and the force is on the other. And there's many different types of simple machines that use this principle. The second class lever has the fulcrum on one end and the load in between the force and the fulcrum. This is, remember, the, first we had the fulcrum in the middle, now we have the load in the middle. And you say, well, wait a minute, this isn't much of a useful tool. It takes a lot of energy to lift this rock up. What if the rock was closer to the fulcrum? All of a sudden, it becomes a lot easier. Does anyone know a machine that uses this principle? You can almost see it rolling along here, a wheelbarrow. The third class lever is the one that would have the third one in the middle and what's left. It's the one with the force. So we got the load out here. 
We have the fulcrum here, and we're now exerting the force in between. Let's see how that is. And you just go, why would anyone want to use this? And if you look closely at it, it's certainly not good for lifting weights because you have to exert a lot more force to get this weight up than you would just lifting it up with your hands. So the advantage of the third class lever is not in lifting heavy weights, but in actually using light weights and getting more movement. Look at this. If we move this part of the bar only this much, look at the amount of movement we get out of the other part. So there's lots of simple machines that use this principle. There's certain times when we want to have the end of something move a lot more than the inside, like a fishing pole or a broom or a rake. Let's take a look at some other examples of all three of these kinds of levers. To be able to identify levers as either first, second, or third class, you must remember those three words in order, fulcrum, load, and force. How to do this? Well, visualize this picture, a triangle that's filled with crumbs. That, of course, is the fulcrum, and that's first. Underneath it is a rectangular box with the word load written inside. That's self-explanatory. And then underneath that, holding them both up, is a giant letter F. And then inside the letter F are the letters O-R-C-E. So we spell the word out. Show this to your students. Let them just visualize it once, and they'll never forget it. Now to the machines. Whenever you pop the top off a paint can using a screwdriver, you're using a first class lever. The fulcrum is between the load and the force. Whenever you're using scissors or pliers, you're actually using two levers at once, where the load is the object you're cutting or holding, the fulcrum, and then the force. Take a look at this can opener. It has the fulcrum here, the load is out here where it grabs onto the can, and the force is here, so it must be a first class lever. Second class levers are number two in our little picture gram where the load must be in the middle. And here's a classic example, a paper cutter. The paper is the load. Take a look at this can opener. Looking closely, we see the fulcrum is out on this end, the load now is here, and the force is here. So unlike the first one we looked at, this one is a second class lever. Third class levers, remember, are useful not for lifting heavy weights, but rather for getting a wide movement. And all kinds of tongs and tweezers use this third class lever, fulcrum being down here. Shovel is another third class lever, and in this case, the fulcrum is near your body, this hand. The load is on the blade of the shovel, whatever you're carrying, and the force is applied somewhere along the handle. Now, if you want to lift a heavy load, you're obviously going to have your, have your force near your load. If you're going to lift a lighter load and want to fling it further, you want your hand further back. And you can exaggerate this by moving it very far back and seeing how much movement you get with the shovel. Whether you're shoveling dirt, swatting flies, or pounding nails, there's a reason and a purpose for a third class lever, just as there are reasons and particular machines that are made using the first and second class levers. Now let's analyze a hammer as a lever, in particular as it pulls nails out of a piece of wood. When the nails pounded in close to the piece of wood, we find the load here, the fulcrum right about here, and the force out here. So it's a first class lever. But what happens if the nail is extending from the wood a ways? Well, all of a sudden, our fulcrum has moved out to here, the other end of the hammer, and our force is in the middle. So we've switched to a third class lever. And we know that's not very useful for exerting a lot of force. Every carpenter knows the answer. That's to insert a piece of wood in between. We now have moved our fulcrum point closer to our load, and our force is on the outside again, so we're back to a first class lever. There are other simple machines besides the lever that help us to do work. One of these is the incline plane. The incline plane, like most levers, allows us to use less force over a greater distance to get the same amount of work done. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a barrel we need to get from here up to here. There's two ways we could do it. One way is to exert a lot of force over a short distance to get this work done. The other way is to use an inclined plane and exert less force over a greater distance to get the same amount of work done. 
Now the inclined plane is used in other areas. One area is a wedge. A wedge could be something like a chisel with two inclined planes back to back. A wedge can also be seen in a knife blade and in a pair of scissors and many different kinds of cutters. Incidentally, if you have two or more simple machines put together, like you have here, then we have what's called a compound machine. This one uses levers and wedges. These compound machines must be handled properly and treated with respect. It's very important to bring safety into your class discussion. Show your students a large pair of cutters like this and not only talk about the sharp surface up here but the long lever arm and the great mechanical advantage that one gets using a tool like this and emphasize safety because it's a very dangerous piece of equipment. Now there's other simple machines too. One of them is the screw. And the screw is really nothing more than an extension of the inclined plane. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You get a pencil and an inclined plane. Put a piece of crayon mark on it and then wrap it around the pencil. All of a sudden we start to see something very familiar. It looks like a screw. It's got the threads that go around and around. What would it look like if we had an inclined plane with a greater mechanical advantage. That's one that goes out with a smaller angle. Well, when we wrap that around the pencil, we see that the threads are much closer together. This implies that a screw with the threads closer together should give us a greater mechanical advantage. And it does. Now what does this mean? Well, it means that it would be easier to put the particular screw into a piece of wood if the threads were closer together. And that screw would have greater holding power. Now, there's other types of simple machines we should investigate. One of them is a wheel and axle. We use a wheel and axle every day whenever we turn a doorknob. The wheel is the handle, the axle is the shaft inside the door. If you ever tried to open a door without a doorknob, you know the force required. Whenever you use a screwdriver, you're using the wheel and axle principle. The axle is the shaft of the screwdriver, the wheel is the handle. The larger the handle on the screwdriver, the greater the mechanical advantage you have. And if there's a screw that you can't get undone, one of the things that I do is increase my mechanical advantage by putting a pair of vice grips on the end of the screwdriver. And I've now increased my wheel diameter appreciably and definitely increased my mechanical advantage. Another thing to think about, have you ever thought about trying to drive a car without a steering wheel holding that little shaft and trying to steer the car? It would be very difficult and a huge amount of force would be required because that steering wheel gives you a tremendous mechanical advantage, the wheel and axle. Closely related to the wheel and axle are gears and pulleys. And pulleys fall into two categories, fixed pulleys and movable pulleys. The fixed pulleys just help to change the direction of the force. The movable pulleys, the ones that move up and down, are the ones that give the mechanical advantage. Show your students the flagpole, the very tip, and show them that when you pull down on the rope, the flag goes up. That's the advantage of using a fixed pulley. And when you talk about gears, here's a good critical thought question to throw at them. Give them a picture of two gears. One with 16 teeth, gear A, and the other with 8 teeth. As gear A makes one turn, one complete turn, how many turns will gear B make? And which direction will it turn? As you get your students more involved with gears, they can start going on to three, four, or five gear systems. It's very important that everyone understands the operation of simple machines. Simple machines have literally saved the day for me in emergency situations, makeshift tools. And I can't even tell you the number of tools I've broken by trying to increase the mechanical advantage. But there are some activities that we can look at to reinforce some of these concepts of simple machines. One of them is to take a closer look at the lever and its mechanical advantage. In this experiment, you get the maximum distance with the minimum amount of equipment. Here's all you need per group. One 12-inch wooden ruler, three pencils that are taped together, one 3 quarter ounce fishing weight, and seven pennies. The three pencils represent the fulcrum, the fishing weight is the load, and the pennies are the force required to lift the load. When you take the ruler and put it on the fulcrum right at six inches, you start to see our old friend the equal arm balance, where any weight on one end has to be counterbalanced with an equal weight on the other end. And that's the first step in our experiment, to put the weight down on one end and see how many pennies it takes to lift this weight off the ground. 
Then, once they've recorded that data, you want to have them move their fulcrum in from 6 inches to 7 inches and make a guess. How many pennies do they think it'll take to lift this weight up? If they understand their simple machines, they'll say less, maybe about 4 pennies. Have them go from 7 inches to 8 inches to 9 inches and maybe even to 10 inches, recording the data each time. You can compare the data from one group to the next. Then, after everybody's back in their seat, you want to make some inferences. Have them think about this question. What would happen if I instead move the fulcrum the other way to five inches or four inches? What would now happen? How many pennies do you think it would take? You can go on and try this experiment. By doing these activities, getting their hands on this equipment, actually recording the data and talking about it, they'll start to understand simple machines and in particular the lever. Rounding out this series in physical science are investigations into forms of energy. This includes heat, light, sound, electricity, and magnetism, and they're on part two of this physical science series. To order science materials, contact the equipment suppliers listed in the printed outline. They'll send your school a catalog.